these turned on? Yes, they're on. Okay, is, her, is hers on too? Yes, it okay, is. Okay, I'll let her know. Test. One, two, three. Oh, yes. Good. A, B, C. <laughs> oh, I don't know what I should say now. <laughs> I thought I might have turned mine off by accident. Okay. Good evening, everybody. It's so nice to see you all here this evening. And so I know I can't quite see people over there, but that's all right. You don't really need to see me. I'll do my part quickly. Um, I'm Laurie Gilman. I'm the owner of East City Bookshop. I want to thank you all. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Our customers are the best. They're the best. <laughs> if you're not one of our customers yet, you want to be part of that group, definitely. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming out tonight for a discussion of Margot Livesey's latest novel, The Road from Belhaven. Before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank everyone at Hill Center for partnering with us for this event and for providing this beautiful historic space redone more than 10 years ago now, which I was kind of shocked to realize. Um, the Hill Center, or Hill Center, provides all kinds of programming. If you're not familiar with it, take a look at the website. There is truly something for everyone, classes, performances for all ages. It's a wonderful community resource. And it is also a nonprofit organization, so of course your donations are always appreciated. I used to work for nonprofits <laughs> that weren't bookstores, and <laughs> so I just I have to say that. Um, and if any of you here, I, a lot of your faces are familiar, but if anyone here hasn't been to East City Bookshop, please come and see us. We are open every day, and we are just a few blocks down the street toward the Capitol, right on Pennsylvania Avenue. We have author events several times a week, almost every week, um, both off-site and in the store. We actually have a store event tonight as well. Um, we have 14 store-sponsored book clubs. Our neighborhood loves a book club, so you can probably find just about anything you're interested in there uh, for adults and kids. And you can look at everything we offer on our website, eastcitybookshop.com. While you're there, you can sign up for the e-newsletter that goes out once a week to tell you about all the events coming up. And you can follow us on any social media platform that you wish. We're probably there. So just look up East City Bookshop. All right. I, I have to get all those things in <laughs> while you're all here. Um, a couple of notes before we get started. Please be sure to silence your phones. Um, and just to note, if anyone didn't see, the books are for sale right outside of this room. We'll have a signing with Margot um, right after. Now I'm turned around. It's that end of the hall, <laughs> there's a table set up where you can get into the signing line after. Um, and we will have questions, we'll have a time for questions at the end of the discussion before the signing line. If you do have a question, um, this is being live streamed, so please wait for someone to bring you a mic and we'll be, they'll be able to hear your question on the live stream. All right. So I think that's all the details. Now on to the main event. Margot Livesey was born and grew up on the edge of the Scottish Highlands. She's the author of a collection of stories, a collection of essays on writing, and nine previous novels, including Ava Moves the Furniture, The Flight of Gemma Hardy, Mercury, and The Boy in the Field. 
She's received awards from the NEA, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the Radcliffe Institute. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and is on the faculty of the Iowa Writers Workshop. In conversation with Ms. Livesey this evening is Alice McDermott. Ms. McDermott is the author of nine novels. The most recent is Absolution, which is available for sale this evening. If you have not yet read it, you'll want to do that. Previous novels include Charming Billy, winner of the National Book Award, and That Night, At Weddings and Wakes, and After This, which were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. Her stories and essays have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, and other publications. She lives near Washington, DC. Please join me in welcoming Margot Livesey and Alice McDermott. Good evening, everyone. Um, it, it's thrilling to be in Washington, D.C. I don't get to come here ev very often, but coming in from Reagan Airport this morning and seeing the monuments, and it, it's th the most like entering a European city of the American cities I know, which I mean as a high compliment <laughs> in a very chauvinistic way. Um, I had elocution lessons as a child, and I'm always grateful to my elocution teacher at moments like this. Um, Alice, thank you so, so much for being in conversation this evening, and um, everyone, sh everyone needs to read your book. It's just amazing. It's also a physically very beautiful book, um, so you will be transported in several ways. Um, the Road from Belhaven uh, is, begins, uh, is set in 1880s Scotland. Um, and I'm just going to read a few pages from the beginning, so I don't need to tell you anything. <laughs> the summer she was 10, she learned not to speak of it. She told the hens, she told the cows, she told the pond at the bottom of the field and the ducks who swam there and her pet jackdaw, Alice. But she did not tell her grandparents, Rab and Flora, or Hugh, the farm boy, or Nellie, who had helped in the house when she, Lizzie, was learning to walk and whom they still saw every week at the kirk. The first picture came on a drich November day. Her grandmother was in the dairy, skimming milk. Her grandfather in the fields, digging potatoes. Lizzie was beneath the kitchen table, making scones for her doll. She must have been three or four years old, when the flagstone floor and her bowl and spoon disappeared. Instead, she was watching her grandfather, his shirt sleeves rolled up, scything hay in the meadow by the river. He was working his way along the bank, cutting wide swathes. One moment the hay was upright, the next fallen. At the end of the row, he stopped to sharpen the scythe. Lizzie could see his shirt clinging to his back as he ran the whetstone back and forth. He was starting on the next row when the blade bit his leg. She was still exclaiming no, scrambling from beneath the table, when the kitchen door opened and her grandfather stepped into the room, carrying a basket of potatoes. As he washed them at the sink, she patted his legs, searching for the cut beneath the rough fabric of his trousers. What is it, Lizzie, he said. Do I have mud on me? She told him what she'd seen. I'd have to be guy clumsy, he said, to cut myself digging tatties. She was still wondering why she had seen a scythe, not a fork, why the sun had been shining though the sky was gray, when her grandmother returned and together they went to feed the hens. By the following July, when Neil, their neighbor, carried her grandmother home in a wheelbarrow, Lizzie had forgotten the scene beneath the table. Only as Dr. Murray made dark, untidy stitches in Rab's leg did she recall her glimpse of the meadow months before. 
She thought of them as pictures because she could see everything so clearly as if she were standing nearby, although she never saw herself. Sometimes she saw ordinary things, her grandmother choosing which hen to kill, a cow stuck in the mud by the river. She saw a picture of Nellie in a white dress at the front of the church, and three months later, Nellie announced she was marrying Angus. You could have knocked me down with a feather, her grandmother said, reporting the news at supper. Lizzie started to say she had known for weeks, but her grandfather was already talking about the sheep shearing. All this happened at Belhaven Farm, which was in that part of Scotland called the Kingdom of Fife, surrounded on three sides by water. The Firth of Forth to the south, the North Sea to the east, the Tay Estuary to the north. Fife was known for its collieries, its fishing, and its university in St Andrews. But the farm was inland, far from the coal mines. The year of Lizzie's birth, the explorer David Livingstone died in Africa. The RMS Atlantic sank off Nova Scotia and the Scottish Rugby Union was founded. On the farm, the most notable events besides her arrival were the mild weather and the early harvest. Where were her parents? On the wall of her bedroom. Her mother had made the drawing the day they got married. Helen, wearing a dress, the folds nicely shaded, was sitting in a chair. Teddy, in his Sunday suit, stood behind her, his left hand resting on her shoulder. Lizzie seldom glanced at them, but every morning she looked at the little white house with two red doors, which had belonged to Helen and which stood on her, Lizzie's, chest of drawers. In fine weather, the woman came out of her door. In bad weather, the man emerged. Sometimes each hovered on the threshold, but they could never come out at the same time. Besides the weather house and the drawing Lizzie had inherited, her mother's border terrier, William, whom they buried in the apple orchard soon after her grandfather cut himself, and a handful of stories. Helen could undo any knot. She could imitate a thrush so that the birds sang back. She was partial to gooseberry jam. About her father, Lizzie knew even less. Teddy had been a fisherman. His boat was named St. Philan after the saint who had lived in a cave on the Fife coast and wrote by the light of his glowing left arm. But neither God nor St. Philan had saved Teddy's boat when the fog rolled in one October day. Seven months later, Lizzie was born. Twelve months later, Helen died. Not because of you, her grandmother had said. Pneumonia. Your father drowned in one way, your mother in another. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margo. Oh, I'm so glad you got to hear this book in Margo's voice um, because um, I have heard over the years, we've been friends for a very long time, and so I've had the pleasure of hearing Margo read from so much of her work that now when I pick up her books, I can hear her voice. And this book especially um, should be read by out loud by you, <laughs> internally by the rest of us. Um, such a beautiful book, uh, congratulations. Um, and as you can tell just from, from those uh, opening pages, um, immediately immersive. Um, not just your beautiful Scottish accent, but, but the spell of the words. Um, but it occurs to me in some way that um, having read your work and, and followed it for all these years, that in some weird way, this is your most autobiographical book. Um, Eva Moves the Furniture, of course, an earlier novel very much came to mind, but but this is a book that, um, I've, even though it's, it's not about you 
in your life, it, in some ways, it seems to me it's an, it's a, an imagining of where you came from. Um, so can you talk a little bit about where this novel came from and um, what you might have been drawing on? Um, it, it is, of course, disguised autobiography, but the origins of the novel are not really my autobiography. Um, my mother, Eva, whom Alice just mentioned, died when I was two and a half, and my father died when I was 22. And at that point, I believed myself to have no living relatives in any meaningful sense. And that belief persisted for well over 40 years. And then in 2017, thanks to Ancestry.com, I received a letter from a woman who said, did Eva McEwen have a living child? And I wrote back and said, she did, and I am that child. And it turned out I was wrong. I have many, many relatives. They just all happen to be near Brisbane and Australia. <laughs> um, Gail, the writer of the letter, was very persuasive. And a few months later, I found myself on a plane to Brisbane. And I had not met anyone with whom I was related for all these decades. So I kept thinking I would feel some sort of magical thing, that I would look at you and think, oh, yes, there is this thing called kinship. Blood does matter, something I've always disputed. And I will say that most of the people were, were lovely, but they just seemed like large, rather sporty Australians. <laughs> Not that I mean this pejoratively for a moment. Um, but I did feel a kind of spark with the two older members of the family, Gwen and John, both siblings, both in their 80s. Was that spark because we shared the most DNA? I, I do not know. But they told me stories about Lizzie Craig and my great-grandmother. And most specifically, they told me that Lizzie had second sight and that everyone in the family knew this and recognized it. Um, it was not, however, particularly useful. You couldn't go to her and say, you, you know, am I going to marry Angus? She wouldn't have a clue. But, but then she might see you wearing a new hat you bought. So it was very sort of random, but they did describe it very much in terms of her seeing pictures, that the sight part of Second Sight was emphasized. And I had no thought of writing about this material until March 2020, which we were just talking about just now, when I suddenly realized I wouldn't be able to go back to Scotland for many months. And so I thought I've got to write a novel that's as Scottish as possible <laughs> so that I can go there every day. But you were already interested in the idea of second sight yes. and, and the sense that it was something yeah. you didn't inherit but might have inherited. Yes, yes. Like, like many hereditary gifts, I, I think second sight skips generations. So my great-grandmother had it and my mother had it in a different form and I sadly so far do not seem to have it <laughs> but i remain ever hopeful <laughs> maybe tomorrow <laughs> so lizzie craig the main character in the novel yeah. and also your great grandmother yeah. um how much did you know about her um other than these tales that that you learned um from I, your I big ha relatives yeah. <laughs> uh, i had a handful of stories uh -huh. And I found that very liberating. I actually know more about my grandmother, uh, Barbara, but precisely because I know more, it feels like her story is already written, whereas Lizzie felt like a, a blank page in a certain way, someone in whom I could pour my imagination and my memories. So that's what I'm really interested in. So when you begin to imagine, um, you have some anecdotal information, um, 
some sense of blood, yeah. <laughs> you know, the DNA is there. Um, how, as, as a novelist, then do you say, where's the, how do I tell this story? How, how do I tell Lizzie Craig's story? Not just as um, a, a compilation of what I heard, but how do I imagine her into life? What was that like? I, that was hard because I think the temptation is to make a character like Lizzie very like myself. Um, so I immediately started changing things. Like, I made her much taller than me because I've always <laughs> wanted to be tall, for instance. Um, I um, gave her certain qualities I conspicuously lacked, like being very good at drawing, for instance. Um, I gave her some qualities I share, like being rather impatient about housework and sewing. Um, I gave her a love of animals that I share. So I sort of mi mixed, up, mixed us up, Lizzie, Lizzie and me, if you, if you will. And, and I kept, um, one thing I did do was to make her an ardent reader so that I got to reread many of the books I had read in my childhood and then I allowed her to read them. Hence Alice, her jackdaw comes from Alice in Wonderland, of course. Um, and um, that was a way of building bridges between us. And, and then um, there's the question, I think, uh, in, in your book of essays about, about writing in the Hidden Machinery, which is a, also a wonderful, wonderful book um, for readers and for writers. Um, but you talk about the sort of going down the rabbit hole of research. So, huh. so set the scene. It's, it's, this is your COVID book, right? I yeah. mean, you're... You, you, you're stuck at home, right. um, you can't go back to Scotland, but you have all your memories, you have these anecdotes about your great-grandmother. Um, what was it like to sit down and begin? Um, did you feel, oh, I, I need info, or is it just, I'll see what happens? I immediately had a certain kind of information, because for four years of my childhood, when I wasn't in at living in the grounds of the boys' private school where my father taught. I went to a farm every day, and the farm was owned by a brother and sister, Selby and Chrissy, and they were like characters out of a William Trevor story, <laughs> which I see as a good thing. Um, um, they had inherited the farm from their parents and rather daringly had bought um, a tractor and a Land Rover but that was the limit of their modernization. So it was very much like this Victorian farm. Mm -hmm. So I, I started writing about the farm. That was my place to stand. And then I started, of course, trying to imagine landscapes outside the farm, um, the village school, the church, um, the shop, the mill, um, the river. Um, I tried to go further afield. I tried to go to St. Andrews, very daringly. Um, and I did, um, you know, do s more serious research. I read farming diaries, which are pretty much like writer's diaries. Wrote five sentences, deleted four of them, you know, <laughs> planted, planted five rows of turnips, three of them failed, you know, they're, they're very up and down diaries. Um, and I read, uh, newspapers of the time, which were very interesting, mm -hmm. um, trying to get behind that scrim of Victorian manners and morals that we have inherited from fiction. And did you do that as you were writing these beautiful sentences, or was it in preparation for writing? Mm. I, I did it all at once, because uh -huh. one of the good things about COVID was how much time we all had. <laughs> I mean, I washed vegetables. <laughs> I, I talked to my friends on Zoom. Um, you know, I had loads of time to, to read and do research and pester my adopted family back in Scotland about whether the primroses had come up. And uh -huh. so <laughs> it, was, it was a very muddled enterprise. But Lizzie was there from the beginning, as, yes. as your... Um, yeah. And the idea of her second sight yes. was... Did you have the sense of, um, since this is, in some ways, an inherited 
piece yeah. of information. Um, yeah. It's something in 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 your own ancestry, um, and it's something I think you you're very interested in as as a fiction yeah. writer yeah. Um, in yeah. in many different ways. Yeah. Um, did you feel was there a dilemma in how to make use of something as metaphorically loaded <laughs> in a novel as Second Sight? Um, you know, yeah. it's the, one of the things I really admire is that it's not a huge hulking metaphor <laughs> in yeah. your novel, yeah. but boy, the temptation to make it one. Um, yeah. uh, yeah. all the various meanings of second yeah. sight and what that says about any individual life, about yeah. it, history, about um, fate mm -hmm. um, and interfering with it. Was yeah. What was that like to, to use that as, you, as your mm -hmm. central defining mm -hmm. characteristic yeah. of your main character? I did do a little bit more research. I didn't just rely on Gwen and John's stories. And I discovered two people among my circle of friends who had second sight. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had not known this before I started. Maybe you should all try asking your friends. Um, <laughs> um, and um, the stories my friends told me were very, were very informative um, because most of what they experienced were very trivial things. Um, Fred is going to lose a gardening glove. Um, some Samantha will find, um, you know, a pound note in the street. You know, they were very, very ordinary. And then just occasionally there would be something much larger. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I am, as you say, just very interested in the uncanny in fiction. I mean, there's a long Scottish tradition, beginning with James Hogg writing Confessions of a Justified Sinner and Robert Louis Stevenson with... Jekyll and Hyde and other and many many Scottish tales. So, but I think there's something about the uncanny or the supernatural that can sort of italicize things that can open up new portals. But because I didn't want it to be a hulking metaphor, <laughs> I initially in my early drafts it, it was almost irrelevant. You know, mm. Lizzie went to the shops. She had a picture. Lizzie milked a cow, she had a picture, and you know, you were going, so what? Um, and I realized part of what would make it be part of the machinery of the novel was that occasionally the pictures would be absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. So that a lot of the time they would be these small, ordinary things. Um, one of my friends described the experience as slipping between the teeth of time. And I thought that was such a beautiful way of mm. expressing it. Um, it, it. But then sometimes the pictures would really make a difference to Lizzie's life. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I tried to do both things, but I didn't want her to be a kind of Cassandra-like figure. Right. And in some ways it's, it's, um, it's her frustration that she isn't and she can't. Um, mm. there, there's one early and, and kind of for me, one of the most harrowing um, pictures she sees um, has to do with, I hope I'm not giving too much away, has to do with you, the, the farmhand. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because um, that yeah, seems yes, very essential. Yes, no, early on in the, um, Lizzie is, um, loves her grandparents, but she's lonely on the farm. And then rather wonderfully, the cowman falls on the ice and they, find um, a boy called Hugh to come and help on the farm. And she becomes devoted to Hugh and um, follows him around. And one day when they're milking the cows, um, she has a picture of Hugh. Um, he's in the orchard and he's covered in bees. And um, she's alarmed, she's frightened. Uh, but she says to him, you're not going to do anything with the beehives, are you? And he says, no, 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 I won't. I promise I won't do anything. Um, but that night she makes a drawing of what she's seen. It's the only time she draws a picture of a picture um, and hides it in her copy of Jane Eyre. And then many months later, um, she and her grandmother go to the seaside for the day. And when they come home, Alice... Lizzie's pet jackdaw goes to fetch her 
and leads her to the orchard, and there is Hugh lying on the grass, covered in bees, and going into an anaphylactic, mm -hmm. I don't know how to say that word, shock. <laughs> And that makes a huge impression on Lizzie. And later that night, she tiptoes down the stairs and burns the picture as incriminating evidence. But but she also sort of, I mean, she she makes him promise. I mean, she yeah. she does yeah. make some attempt to change yeah. to forestall um, the future, the, right, yeah. to forestall. Um, and then quickly following that, there's Acorn. The, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, their, their, their the beloved horse. Yes. yes, the very beloved horse, and and um, and she has another mm -hmm. picture yeah. um, when yeah. she sees him with yeah. a kind of lockjaw, yes. um, and and then it once again determines to somehow um, yeah. change that course and fails at that too. Yeah, yeah, she does make efforts to avert the pictures, and they grow. In, I would say increasingly determined as the novel goes on and as the stakes get higher. <laughs> We're both wondering what to say about that. <laughs> yeah, no, because it's um, f um, obviously we're both novelists, so I'm sure this probably occurred to you too, but as a novelist reading um, a wonderful novel, um, it struck, without a, becoming a big hulking metaphor, um, it struck me um, so much um, like the process, the imaginative process, the very mm -hmm. process that brings you into the life of the great grandmother yeah. you never knew. Yeah. Um, uh, that the maybe it's the vividness of yeah. the pictures as they come to her. Uh, she knows, for instance, when Acorn she sees Acorn um, in the field, and she knows by the blossoms around her what season yeah. this will happen yeah. in. Um, so she uses th various details in her pictures to give clues. Uh, it's not happening now, but it's going to happen yeah. um, when when the blossoms are out. Um, um, and and it seems to me that there there is something about the the writing process, um, yeah. the the process yeah. of um, seeing something that's not there clearly, yeah. um, and then the attempt to make sense of it to to. Yeah to draw mm. from the clues that have been given to you by your own yeah. imagination, because in many ways, this second sight is, um, is a product of imagination as much as anything else. Yeah, no, I mean, I think for me at the moment, reading, especially rereading and writing are the closest I come to second sight. I mean, sometimes when I'm rereading something of which I've partly or mostly forgot, forgotten the story, I'll think, oh no, Romeo and Juliet, it's not going to work out. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> late in the day I will remember. <laughs> and it looked so promising. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But do you see things when you're writing? Do you have that feeling of moving towards something you're partially seeing and trying to see more clearly? Well, I mean, yeah, well, I mean, th uh, that's... That's our obligation yeah. to the reader. Um, that's Conrad's, um, yeah. you know, one injunction to the writer that um, you must make us see. You know, if we're if if we're entering into a story and we're not seeing, yeah. um, the, it's a it's a film that hasn't started running yeah. yet yeah. in in our brains. Um, but but it's that sense um, that Lizzie has um, a kind of frustration that the that the vision exists um, and, and she cannot affect it. She can see it, but she can't affect it. Um, and I have heard other writers, and I suppose I sometimes have um, had said something like this myself, um, that when you're in the process of, of writing a story, writing a novel, there are moments um, well into it where you feel you're not in charge, yeah. that I would like for Acorn not to scratch his mm -hmm. legs and get lockjaw and yeah. die, but the story says I, that has mm -hmm. to happen. Yeah. Um, and, and so I saw that in Lizzie sort of coming to terms with her inability. Um, the picture will win out. Yeah. No, there's a, um, 
a, a lovely quotation from Pushkin, the Russian novelist writing to a friend about the novel he's currently working on. And he, he writes to his friend, my Stella has run off and got married. I never would have expected it of her. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I just thought, so, so charming. <laughs> he, he was planning spinsterhood for Stella, but no, she had her own, she had her own plans. Um, but yes, no, and it, it's, it, it's such an interesting moment when you do begin to feel the, sh the shape of a narrative or the possible shape. And one of the things that I, I can't really talk about without spoiling the novel was that in Australia I, I heard one word, and that one word was the word I was writing to in the novel. Mm. It's, it's very deep in the novel. Um, so I did have a kind of destination that I was ardently trying to reach. And no sense that, that you could change it once you got there, that it was somehow... it. It was pre-existing. It, it was a sort of eaching destination. You could read it several ways. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Lizzie with the second sight, um, st she she grows up. There's a, it's a coming of age novel mm -hmm. in many ways. Yes. Um, it, her growing up, yeah. feeling she wants to see a bigger world and yeah. get to Glasgow. Um, but she sure doesn't see what I think, as readers, we all see when the wrong guy shows up. <laughs> um, yeah. well, were you tempted to, to maybe um, let her have a picture uh, I, I let her early have a on? Picture of the wrong guy. <laughs> you know, maybe, it's, maybe this is where the autobiographical elements are winning out. <laughs> you know, I think. Uh, that phrase could designate a number of people in my life. Um, <laughs> so maybe I have a high tolerance of, of, of these things. But, but I think one of the things that's exciting about writing about that period in Scotland is that it is the great age of industrialization. And that meant that if you grew up in the countryside, you didn't have to stay there. You could move to the city and you could make money, not maybe a lot, but you could make some money. People had a kind of autonomy they hadn't had before. Um, so it was a time of, of you know, considerable movement. And Glasgow, the city that Lizzie ends up going to, was a, an industrial powerhouse with the great shipyards flourishing and a wonderful university and many, many things going on there. And she's able to make a career of sorts, or at least find a good job because of her drawing skills, not yeah, not yeah. because of her yeah. second sight. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I, um, one of the many ways I did research um, was looking at a newspaper. Oh, newspaper is not quite the right. Maybe a magazine called the Girl's Own Paper, which ran competitions of various kinds, and girls could enter essays and. One year, the competition was um, um, my, a, 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 a day at work, I think. Mm -hmm. So girls wrote in describing a day at their job, and I gave one of the jobs to Lizzie. Isn't that what she sketches locomotive? Yeah. yeah. Is that right? The yes, she's a locomotive tracer. Uh -huh. It's a little too complicated to explain to everyone, but you can ask me individually, and I'll try to <laughs> convey the essence. <laughs> You know, I, um, I, I read, I don't know if it was, uh, your reviews have been wonderful, by the way. Um, uh, congratulations on that, too. But I think one of the reviews that I read that I didn't agree with was um, talking about that she gets to Glasgow and um, uh, sort of learns all the lessons of the hard life in the city. And I felt she, she really... Um, meets a lot of kindness, yeah. uh, an incredible amount of kindness um, when she gets there. Um, did, yeah. Do you know what I'm referring to? I do, you, I yeah. do. and I've, I think I've now written two novels in a row without a single swear word, <laughs> which is quite an accomplishment. Yes. And, um, <laughs> and it's partly I feel like I'm writing in opposition to what I perceive as a rising tide of incivility. So people in Glasgow are perhaps a little bit nicer than they may have been in the <laughs> 1880s, but <laughs> more power to them. Um, and it, it was, but it was a, an acknowledged part of my agenda, if you mm -hmm. will. Mm -hmm. 
And another part of my agenda was that I was really, really interested in writing about that moment. You know, you can know so much as, about, as a child. You can be so intelligent as a child and so passionate and have such a clear vision of the adults around you. But suddenly you discover there's this thing you have had no inkling of, sexual attraction. And all these adults you thought were behaving in rational, intelligent ways, you suddenly realize are completely crazy. <laughs> um, so I was very interested in showing someone crossing that moment into thinking, oh, there's this dark river running under everything that is influencing people and changing their behavior. And you, you just glimpse it. You have to pay close attention and then you can glimpse it in people. And she really is a, she comes to that as, as a, it's a revelation. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. she had no, except yeah. for what she knows about yeah. farm animals. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. but, but she's not naive. Yeah. yeah. She, um, I think she is actually naive, but, um, but um, mechanically. Mechanically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it, I, I just find it such a fascinating moment, and of course, it's a moment that's largely absent from the Victorian novel up until mm -hmm. Wuthering Heights, and mm -hmm. then, you know, I see Thomas Hardy as heralding in mm -hmm. <laughs> the great admission that actually people are attracted to each other, and sometimes not in the most rational way. Right, and are driven, and uh, often driven by yeah, it, uh, yeah. into doing things they probably should not yeah, do. Yeah, um, yes. But but she is surrounded by kind, mostly women, um, yeah. her women friends, yeah. but but she's sort of well taken care of, even as a, um, a, a innocent young farm yeah. girl yeah. Um, come to the, to the big yeah. city. Um, which made me wonder about, um, the religious aspect. I mean, we know she's been raised in a religious mm -hmm. household. They go to church. A couple of the ministers in the book mm -hmm. have some fair amount of influence as yeah. ministers. Um, um, was it pre would they be Presbyterian? Is that fair to ask? Uh, they would be, yes. Presbyterian's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about it for a moment, but I think we should stick with Presbyterian. <laughs> Um, when you were doing your research, was was that something um, you felt you had to? I mean, we have again. Don't want to give too much away, but um, we do have an unmarried young woman who's expecting a child. Um, yeah. Well, I was that child who went to Sunday school every Sunday, and um, for a while, fervently believed what I was reading reading every Sunday, what I was, the, the, the verses I was learning by rote. Um, I had a, a project of walking on water that I pursued quite, <laughs> quite ardently for quite some time, fortunately in a rather shallow river, but yeah. Um, and um, so I always, I, I was tempted to sort of go into that with Lizzie and then I worried that might become a little too much of a MacGuffin, as it were, to bring in the, the contrast, if you will, between the pragmatic, upright people who surround her mm -hmm. and then these outrageous things that are happening in church every Sunday, you know, feeding a thousand people with five loaves and seven fishes or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. turning water into wine. I mean, it's very implausible. So it seemed, but it seemed like it might be rather confusing to bring that in. <laughs> but it, it's not, um, I mean, it, it doesn't, this is what I admired about it, that um, I, I feared, um, given the time and the place and the age, um, that it would um, in some way sap the, the kindness mm -hmm. of the people who mm -hmm. understand her situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, not only the people in Glasgow, but her grandparents, um, yeah. who are wonderful, Rab yeah. and Flora, who yeah. are wonderful characters. Um, everybody should have a grandmother right. like Flora, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. the farm wife. Um, yeah. uh, and, and even they, um, al although, Lizzie is not always 
the best um, granddaughter, um, yeah. adopted granddaughter yeah. since yeah. they raised her. Um, mm -hmm. they, they are generous, it yeah. seems to me, especially for people of that time and place. Yeah. Um, d did they just sort of, um, you, you gave them the grace <laughs> of, of that kind of generosity? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, again, was that something that you felt was inherent in their character so that they would not, um, mm -hmm. not be too much brimstone and, um, uh, you know, hell, mm -hmm. <laughs> hellfire when, yeah. when she comes home unmarried with a baby? Yeah. I mean, I think we have a, a mis... I mean, I think Queen Victoria worked very hard to correct the unfortunate portrait of the British monarchy that had developed over preceding centuries of um, bad behaviour. And she is the one who, um, I think, is now responsible in some ways for all the scandals that beset the royal family, that the standard of behaviour she set is too high. Um, or it seems to be too high because they're falling beneath it. <laughs> um, but, um, it, you know, the diaries and letters I read about Victorian life um, showed, a, showed a different picture, mm -hmm. showed a, a broader humanity, a, mm -hmm. a greater acceptance. And in rural villages, you know, most people knew what was going on and there was quite a high tolerance for various kinds of romantic liaisons. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in creating Lizzie's grandparents, um, I very much didn't want to reproduce the Scottish patriarch. I had enough of those people in my childhood. <laughs> I, I wasn't writing to have another person like that. <laughs> so I did work hard to make the grandparents both God-fearing and sympathetic. Mm -hmm. Did you worry at any point because, I mean, there is, Lizzie doesn't always d do her best by them. No. Um, uh, <laughs> I mean, she's not always the best correspondent. <laughs> she's not, well, I'm just going to go to Glasgow for the weekend. Will you take care of the baby? I'll be back in three months. Um, <laughs> did, did that sort of rise organically out of her character or again, did you, did you sort of, want to make sure that she wasn't too good. Yeah. Um, no, I don't, I don't want to give too much away about the novel, but I've always loved that moment in Mill on the Floss when Maggie Tulliver stays in the boat and the boat goes down the river and the boat carries her off with, I think his name is Stephen, and terrible repercussions come of that. Uh -huh. uh, and that moment where you can slide from one kind of behavior to another with perhaps without perhaps fully intending it. And again, perhaps there are some autobiographical elements <laughs> yeah. in these descriptions that perhaps not all the choices of my younger self were in my own best interests. But I also believe there's an overworked angel watching over young people uh -huh. who is taking care of them and explains an extraordinary survival rate. <laughs> <laughs> There, there's, a, there's a wonderful uh, passage where um, she, she is, she, she, she knows she should go back home. She's, she's mm -hmm. left the baby with her aging mm -hmm. grandparents. Um, and it, it's, it struck me as, um, yes, very reminiscent of adolescence, of, um, no, no, I'm going to go home. Um, I'm just going to go apply for this job. But if I get it, I'm not going to take it because I'm going to go home. But I'm going to apply for it. Well, I got it. Well, I'm not going to take. Well, maybe I'll just take it for a day. <laughs> you know, yeah. she does that 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 wonderful um, way of of sort of doing the wrong thing, but wiggling out of any um, sense of bad conscience yeah. for having done it. Yeah. <laughs> Was that also something you drew oh. on? <laughs> oh, absolutely not, Alice. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, I was too too busy reading Victorian novels to <laughs> do anything anything like that. <laughs> um, do you think we should see if there we are any should, questions yes, from we, the we, audience? We have time um, for some questions. Do we have, have um, time for a couple of questions? Any anyone on this side of the room? Then I'll come over there. <laughs> um, you you talked about when a, a story maybe isn't going well. I, I, I'm actually talking 
to both of you now, yeah. if that's all right. Yeah. What happens when a character doesn't seem to jump off the page? That when they when they just don't seem alive as you're starting out, what do you do? Do you do you have a a trick to it? Yeah. <laughs> I think I I think I usually try to put them in a very in a difficult situation. You know, they come home and there's an eviction notice on their door, <laughs> for instance. Um, you know, or somebody thinks they've stolen a library book. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, difficult. So, something that will put pressure on them, so I can see what they'll do when they are squeezed. <laughs> I think about the Greek philosopher Thales. I think his name was who believed everything was made of water and. People brought him rocks, and he said, squeeze harder. <laughs> so I, I, that's what I'm picturing. What about you, Alice? You know, I, I think it's, um, uh, it's write it again. <laughs> you know, it's, it's do it again. Um, you're not looking hard enough. It's that looking. It's yeah. that seeing. Look again. Um, you know, you, you took the easy route. You, you showed us what we readers and every writer is her own first reader. So I put myself in that, as a reader, um, you took the easy route. You told me what I already knew about such characters or, and I'm agreeing with you because I say, oh, I know characters just like that. That's why it's not coming. See them again. Uh, find the thing that is there that nobody else notices. Um, so it's, it's that drill it down. And I think that's, you know, that's probably the kind of writing advice we're always giving to, to um, beginning writers. Um, you know, uh, yeah, you got the surface. Now see it again. We don't need we don't need to pick up 300 pages and be inside your sentences for 300 pages to see what we already know. See it again. Find that one thing. And and pressure does it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's circumstantial, but but it's also. Um, you're not pushing it. You're not pushing it. Um, you're 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 relaxing on um, on the easy part, even if it's true. It's too easy. <laughs> yeah. I think there was a question over here. Were there were there particular writers who you found most useful? Um, you mentioned Hardy and Elliot, uh, E. T. A. Hoffman, and the Uncanny. Uh, just uh, curious about that. Um, I read um, I read some of the books that um, my great aunts had won as Sunday school prizes, books that told children how to be good. Um, I reread children's books of the Victorian period. It was the first time there had started to be children's books. And there were books that were sort of masquerading as children's books that were really quite political, like... Um, Charles Kingsley's *The Water Babies*, for instance, I, I reread. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, um, I reread Robert Louis Stevenson with devotion. Um, uh, his novel *Kidnap*, for instance, is set almost a hundred years before Stevenson was writing, and it's as fresh and sparkling. You wouldn't. It has no. Sometimes we think of historical novels as having a kind of heaviness, but kidnapped is all is all lightness and um, and um, yeah, I, and I did I did read parts of the Bible to be reminded of of that the King James Bible to be reminded of that language. Um, I couldn't resist going back to Jane Austen because who can? <laughs> One more question. Anyone? Alice, would you like to ask the last question? Oh, there's somebody over here. Yes. I want to ask about second sight in the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, now, is, you said it's genetic, and so this is still uh, something that's prevalent in Scotland, and is it considered, <laughs> is it considered a gift or satanic or... or how does that work? Um, I should perhaps correct the impression. I'm not certain it's hereditary. I just know in my family there are two instances of it. But perhaps it's just 
chance, perhaps it's just random. I think the uh, Scottish culture, um, as it is represented in literature and films, is more sympathetic to the idea of second sight. But it's not like you meet people on the street corners of Edinburgh saying, oh, hi, I've had a vision, <laughs> you know, or, or something, you know. Um, that, that is not happening. Um, so I, I, I don't know really what to say as to whether it's more hospitable. I mean, walking around the neighbourhood this afternoon with my friend Rebecca, we saw a place offering um, tarot readings. Is, is, that, is that any different? I'm, I mean, you know... So, um, but I think that the Celtic culture um, in Scotland, in Ireland, and I would argue in Nova Scotia with the great Canadian writer Alistair MacLeod, that we have these instantiations of, of second sight that feel, that feel persuasive, that feel possible. Um, what do you think it is? I mean, what do you think practically? Is it a... Something happens in the brain. Uh, does it come from the spirit world? What, I mean, what, what's, what do you really think it is? <laughs> what are we, drill down. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think that I believe there is a work. There are things beyond those which we immediately apprehend through the obvious five senses. I do believe there is another another sense, a deeper sense. And almost everyone experiences things in different ways, whether it's a, a, pre a premonition, a moment of surprising coincidence or serendipity that, that startles you. I think everyone gets twinges of having a feeling that maybe there is some arrangement in the universe that we're not fully able to grasp or comprehend. Um, and I, I just, I mean, at least in, in Britain and perhaps also in the States, um, seances were known in the Victorian period, um, but it was the First World War with the um, uh, tremendous mortality rate that made people turn to seances in a desperate effort to reach the dead. And um, there is a town in, in, um, in America, in New York State, called something like Ladydale, I think that's right, which is awash in seances. And I've only just discovered this place, but I'm planning to visit it in the summer and try to attend a few and see what that's like. So I'll be able to answer your question better in a few months' time. Thank you so much, Margo. This has been so much fun. Thank you. It's a wonderful book. Yes, thank you. Thank you both so much. And just a reminder that uh, both Alice and Margo will be signing books. They're available for sale just right outside the door. So thank you all for coming, and thank you both.